Now uh, we will welcome Professor Massimo Vargasola. He will talk about decision making and learning in the life sciences. So over to you, sir. Thank you. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, so I'll be talking about decision making and learning. Um, as you will see, the in life sciences, I will pick examples from the life sciences, and I'll I'll give motivation for the life sciences. Um, the way I've structured this is that I'll be uh, I'll try to give you uh, an idea of how things are done, in particular in uh, decision-making and reinforcement learning, the theoretical basis of this. And for the examples, uh, I'll, I'll defer to the, to the literature because anyway, there's so many examples this day, so I'll give you the references and I won't project uh, slides. Uh, you, can, you can read them directly uh, from, the, from the literature. So the... Um, the, the plan, here we go. Uh, the plan of the lectures goes as follows. We'll uh, start with active. Oh, I should not read there. Okay. Versus passive learning. Um, then we'll be doing a few examples. Um, <clears throat> which are bandits, multi arm Then we'll be doing uh, navigation. And, uh, and then we'll be doing uh, Bergen Purcell. And SPRT. Waltz, Waltz, SPRT. This stands for sequential probability ratio test. And then we'll get into the uh, reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning, of course, we cannot do uh, all there is around there. We'll be doing uh, Markov decision processes. MDPs and Bellman equation. Then we'll be doing POMDP. MDP stands for Markov decision processes, POMDP for partially observing observable Markov decision processes, and then we'll be doing Q learning. So that's that's the plan. And uh, feel free to ask questions anytime. Okay, so. A Q is the function which is going to get learned. Uh, we'll get there. It's called the quality function. Thank you. No, no quantum. No quantum. Uh, well, you can do learning on quantum system. It's been applied to quantum system, for example, for having protocols uh, of how to design a quantum system. So reinforcement learning has been used for quantum system, but Q stands for quality. Thanks for asking questions. As I said, feel, feel free to ask. Um, now, as I said, we, I, I will not show slides of uh, uh, applications because there's, there's a lot. And in particular, there's an issue that you can, uh, that you can look at, which is the multidisciplinary. Nature of machine intelligence. which is in nature 2018. And in this one, you can, find, uh, you can find the application that I've been, one of the applications that I've been concerned with, which has been together with Gautam Reddy, we've been looking at Terry Senovsky, we'll be looking at the, uh, at the flight and Antonio Celani, I forgot to mention. Um, we've been looking at the soaring flight. So how to train by reinforcement learning some gliders without engines, how to stay aloft for uh, tens of minutes. So you can use these techniques of reinforcement learning in order to do this kind of navigation, which is complicated because the atmosphere is turbulent and therefore you have ascending currents, but you also have descending currents. So that's an application and there's many, many more. As you can see, it's an issue on multidisciplinary, so you can find 
as many examples as you as you like. If you are uh, looking for uh, uh, active matter, then there's a there's a, a machine learning for active uh, matter, which is a review paper, Sikos et al, and it's in Nature Machine Learning. 2020 that's for active matter if you're more into uh, uh, fluid dynamics then it's Brampton et al uh, it's annual reviews of fluid mechanics and it's 2020 as well and then if you want more on statistical physics then there's a uh, uh, it's machine learning and physical sciences. So this is broader. And this is review of modern physics. Modern physics 2009. Okay. So you can you can find examples, you can find references, you can find uh, 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 as much material as you want. The purpose uh, of these three lectures for me will be to give you a basis to navigate into this literature, which has a lot, is booming, it has a lot of applications. So to give you kind of an overview and to structure and to give you a sense of how things are done and where, where it's going. Okay, so if there's no question on this part, then we can start. And the way I want to start is that I want to put uh, reinforcement learning, which is what we'll be discussing here, uh, in broader perspective compared to supervised and unsupervised learning. So what is supervised learning? Supervised learning is that I give you a, a set of data, which are typically a label. So X is the, is the input data, which could be in any uh, dimension of space. And Y of I is the label. So the typical example is that I give you an image and then I tell you the label, which is going to be as usual cut and off. Um, and there's a bunch of them. And the general goal is to classify this data and to find the mapping of the input data. So uh, a mapping of X into Y. So what you want is, it's in general, it's a classification problem. You want a function which could possibly could be stochastic. And you want the, given a, an input date, datum, it gives you the, the label which is associated with. And um, in general, what you want to have is to, is to build a probability distribution of the labels given the X. And if you're not too ambitious, you can even go down and just look which is what is typically done for the expected value of the label given given the data which then maps into the a, a kind of a deterministic uh, can, can be mapped into a deterministic problem and typically what you want is that you want to uh, then to generalize which is that uh, you train your system into this bunch of data and then you want to look at how the problem generalizes so classifies classifies unseen previously data into the label and you quantify the mistake that you make by a loss function. Which gives you uh, the difference between the function that you learn G and, uh, and the outcome. And the typical techniques that are applied are support vector machines, uh, neural nets, decision trees, That's it. 
So this is a typical uh, this is a typical problem in supervised uh, learning. And the important point I want to make is that you're given a bunch of data, capital N, and you do something with that. You learn, and then you you train your system on the bunch of data, and then you apply to unknown data. So you're given a fixed bunch of data, and this is something which you can I can I can class I can I classify as passive in the sense that you're given this data, you do what you have to do, and then you apply your uh, uh, learn function onto onto the new bunch of data. Okay, uh, what is unsupervised? Unsupervised now is that data are not labeled. Okay, so uh, you have X1, Xn, they belong into Rd typically. And the general goal is to uh, uh, unveil a pattern goal and produce an effective, effective representation. By an effective representation, what, what you mean is that typically you produce a generative model, P of theta of X, where typically the space of parameters theta lives in a smaller space, R to the N. And usually N should be much smaller than D. This way you, you compress your, your problem, you compress your data and the typical tools, methods that you use are something like clustering. That's a classical problem of clustering the, the data into, into subsets. Uh, you can have dimensionality reduction. Like for example, TCA, principal component analysis. Uh, independent component analysis, uh, SVD, uh, autoencoders, okay. <clears throat> So these are the two main uh, 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 structures that one typically uh, encounters. Uh, reinforcement learning is something else. It's a third uh, paradigm. And what reinforcement learning is, is that um, you have a uh, agents that actively interact with the environment. And what they want to do is that they want to maximize a cumulative reward. Or minimize a cumulative cost. And by taking actions, and controlling the system. So there's, there's several things which I've highlighted because they are, uh, they are quite different from the, previous, from the previous one. The first one is that they actively interact with the system. I've been stressing that in these two problems, supervised and unsupervised, you're given a, a bunch of data and you do your analysis, you apply your statistical tools to them, and possibly then based on this, you make some decisions, but you don't interact continuously with the stream of data. What you do in reinforcement learning, and as you will see, there are good reasons for doing this, this is the first part of what I'll be doing, 
you actively interact with the stream of data in several ways that I'll be, I'll be discussing. And there's an environment. The environment is typically stochastic. So you, but it can also be deterministic, then it becomes more like a control problem. And um, there's another important point is that you want to maximize the cumulative reward. Cumulative reward means that you, you're given some reward at a given time, but what you really care is not the immediate reward that you get at the, at the time that you're making an action, but it's a cumulative reward. So you sum over time, which, which boats the problem immediately of what is called for planning. So you cannot just think of what you're gonna do very greedily at the next time step, but you have to foreplan what the consequence and what the uh, impact of your actions is going to be on the, on the future. And that's, where, uh, that's why it's important to, to have this cumulative reward which plays. And the other problem is that you take actions. So you can change your environment, you can change your state, you can modify the statistics of the data that you're going to receive. And this, uh, again, brings in the problem of control. The problem of control, which is a, a much older data than, than reinforcement learning, but takes a different uh, way of doing things because in control, you, you kind of have a model of the, uh, of the system and you try to have as good as possible a model of the system. While in reinforcement learning, you will see, you tend to have a much more empirical uh, uh, data-driven based approach to the, to the, to the dynamics. So this is the uh, this is the 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 the, the, the idea, and uh, because there are several things that come into into this uh, third uh, paradigm, uh, I would like to start by discussing what I mean by actively interacting with the environment and why do you have to take because as you will see it's much easier to define the problem where in the passive uh, framework where you just take a bunch of data and you apply a statistical tool. As soon as you start interacting with the environment, it's like the unhappy family of Tolstoy. Each one, uh, you, you immediately open the Pandora box of how you should be active. And therefore, I would like to motivate uh, why you should be doing this, uh, this active interaction with the stream of data and why it's, uh, it's useful and how you can, it, it does bring a lot of uh, advantages and why you should be uh, taking this, uh, this uh, nuisance apparently nuisance uh, problem. Any question? Okay. So if there's no question, then let me start with the uh, active This one I can erase? Sure. So the environment, the environment, so the question is, what is the environment? The environment is going to be very, very different. It depends on the example. Uh, for example, uh, if, if, if we're going to take the, uh, the example of the, of the bandits, which is going to be slot machines, this is going to be uh, the, the, state of the, the state of the slot machines. So how much reward you're going to get if you play one arm, different slot machines, you play one arm, this is going to be the state of the environment is going to be how the slot machines are arranged and what is the probability of winning for each one of the slot machines. Uh, for the example of the, of the gliders that I was mentioning before, it's the, state of the, it's the state of the atmosphere and the state of your own glider, for example, how you, you, your angles of you, of a bank and so on are at that particular uh, moment of time. So the environment would be, in that case, the state of the atmosphere, which is around you. Um, all these examples will come, will come along. But just imagine that you, you are the agent and you're interacting, you're receiving some observations. Another example, maybe I can give it now, uh, could be the, uh, the problem of navigation. In the problem of navigation, what happens olfactory navigation is that you have a source of odors, which is here. Uh, this is sending out uh, uh, is sending out odors, molecules of odors, 
you have an agent here which is moving and the state of the environment is where the source is located what is the emission rate how much molecules you detect per unit time and so on okay? and of course the state of the environment is also there's wind which is blowing and transporting the the, the odors so the state of the environment describes the entire environment which is around you which is made of the source of odors of the wind of the turbulence which is transporting all this and this this source is always stochastic this, Say it source, again. this is always stochastic here. this is typically stochastic it could be deterministic deterministic is going to be just one special case of the stochastic case where the dynamics is is perfectly well defined so we're going to treat the stochastic case and typically what you're interested in in all these applications as you will see is the expected reward uh, so the reward at least the reward is taken the average but the state of the environment typically is stochastic which is what brings the, diff the major difference otherwise it becomes a a, a a simpler problem which is not trivial when we're going to do the bellman equation you will see it still not can be non-trivial for example, in chess, uh, but but in general, we can treat a stochastic and then take the deterministic case. Yes. Uh, Hello. Yes. So, is there a notion of time always involved? Time or progression involved in reinforcement learning? Is there a notion of time or uh, progressions? involved in reinforcement learning all the time. yes so that's the main that's the main point which i'll try to uh, which i'll try to make is that active in reinforcement learning you have to interact with the environment and there's a notion of time which is which is progressing in uh, all along in these problems here you can also have a notion of time in the sense that as the data come you you do something but you don't interact with the with the with the data so in reinforcement learning there's a natural as you will see as soon as we get to the definition of the active system and reinforcement learning yes the essential point is that there's a there's a notion of time and in fact cumulative reward means exactly this because what you do is that you accumulate over time and typically you have a you have a discounted reward which means that over time you're more interested in the close future than in the in the far future therefore there will be a discount factor which is going to take into account how much more in the future you're going to go so yes the answer is absolutely and you hopefully you will see this coming about from the from the presentation I have a related question um, in, in neural networks and so I wonder if there's some analog of getting into uh, loops and recurrences where you go back and uh, have something similar in time yeah well in time what we are going to do as you will see typically what is being done in this um, in a in, in, in all these applications is that you boil down to something which is effectively Markovian. Effectively Markovian doesn't mean that you don't remember, even though Markovian of course means that that is Markovian, but all these systems are cooked up in a way that you can define internal degrees of freedom. And once you define internal degrees of freedom, you can store memory. But typically, you still work at this level with Markovian system. Markovian system, possibly with internal degrees of freedom, but you don't go back to the to the to the to the past. You store the past in an effective form, in a in a concise form. It can be beliefs, it can be uh, the the Q function, it can be thing. But you you typically don't go back. So you store something which takes into account the the past, but you don't go and revisit. All, all the data. Thank you. You're uh, Excuse me. Okay. Yes. You mentioned this uh, cumulative reward. Yes. Uh, in case of a, a slot machine, I understand the reward. But in a in a different system, I don't know. Um, what exactly that reward means in a mathematical sense? So there's two two ways to answer this question. One is that we'll define 
the cumulative reward in all the examples that we'll be working on. But in general, what 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 I mean by cumulative reward is that there's a, uh, there's at each time step. Okay, so you you are at time t. Let's discretize time, which is which is easier. Uh, then what you're going to do, the typical scheme is going to is that you're going to take a, a, a an action. There's the environment here. Um, then you're going to take a, 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 a an action. There's going to be percepts and observations which are going to be made here. And at each time step, what you do is that you take you make an action, which means you change your state and possibly you change the state of the environment, and you get a, a reward. You get the reward for the function and the state that you're uh, that you. So I'll define all this stuff. You make an action given a certain state. You transition to another state, which is S prime, and you get a certain reward which in the case, for example, of the bandits could be whether you win or you lose. In the case of the olfactory navigation could be how much you approach the source and, and so on. And by cumulative reward, what I mean is that what you're interested in is uh, this object here, where lambda is the so-called discount factor. So what you see from this is that uh, cumulative because you're summing over all possible times. And, but there's a discount factor. If this discount factor lambda goes to zero, then you're only interested in the next time step. So there's no, there's no cumulative effect. If lambda's lambda approaches one, I'm interested more and more into the far future and I wait all times in an equal way. So what I want to do is that I would like to maximize this reward, this cumulative reward, which is, which is here. So that's the, gonna be the mathematical definition of the, of the problem. Sure. Yeah. In, let's say I want to feed some data. Yes. Uh, and then I want to do it uh, in this way. Yeah. So in that case, uh, the reward, or can you call this reward to be something like an uh, uh, inverse of the errors? Yes, it could be. I mean, that's one way of posing the problem. The other way of posing the problem is that you have a cost function and you want to minimize the cost function. Okay. So in your example, that would be, that would be the cost and I want to minimize the cost. And you can map the problem of maximizing a reward. Of course, you change sign and you immediately get the problem of a cost you want to minimize. Uh, how is this lambda defined? Like how to interpret? Lambda, which is defined, it's up to you in, uh, in applications. Uh, in general, there's a lambda factor, which is, which is defined. It's defined based on the, uh, that's part of your, uh, that's part of your, uh, uh, definition of the problem. So nobody's, in general, nobody's going to give you the lambda. But just to give you a sense of how this lambda is chosen, um, the lambda is going to give you the horizon. So lambda, the discount factor, defines the horizon. What I mean by this, imagine for a second that R of T is flat. Therefore, what is going to happen is that uh, the sum of the lambda of T is going to be one minus one minus lambda. And if lambda is equal to zero, this is equal to one. So it's one time step that you really care about. If lambda goes to one, then this is gonna to go to infinity. Okay. So lambda gives you a measure, which is roughly defined by this one over one minus lambda of the horizon over which you're interested in maximizing your reward. In economy, for example, 
because all this stuff is also applied in, uh, in economy, nobody's going to give you the, the answer, right? Because depending on the kind of investor, for example, that you want to define the portfolio for, this investor could be very aggressive. It could be very conservative. So in the two cases, you want to define a lambda, which is different. And in particular, the aggressive one should be more greedy. Therefore, your lambda that you put into the optimization scheme is going to be smaller. If you have someone which is very conservative and goes for the long term, then lambda should be longer. This is something that it's up to you. In the case of the applications that were there, uh, it is known that this glider, uh, they fly, they take something of the order based on the birds, they take something of the order of a few minutes to get to the clouds. And therefore, what you do is that you pick a lambda such that the corresponding time over which you want to maximize the reward is of the order of a few minutes. But in general, it's up to you. And depending on lambda, you're going to get different policies of action and different optimal actions that, you, that you're going to get. Is it what? Like the context there, standard. I don't know what it is. It's uh, how far up to the tree. It's kind of a correct, yes. So in that case, it's the, yes. Yeah, it is, it is somewhat analogous to that. Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Any other question? So, uh, so let's get to the first example, which is really, which is really simple, but I think it's, it's still useful. Um, and <clears throat> it served the purpose of starting to illustrate uh, the active nature of learning and decision-making. Um, so the example that I want to, uh, to give is the so-called high-low game. High-low game is a, very simple, is a very simple one, which in fact is a general problem it's a general problem, but in our case, we'll be, doing, we'll be doing a simple one, which is the identification of a boundary. And of course, this problem can become quite complicated in high dimensions. We'll be doing the 1D case just to, uh, just to be simple and to illustrate the uh, active nature. So simple 1D. So what is the problem in 1D? Uh, in 1D, the problem is very simple. I'm given a, an interval, which uh, uh, x left, x right, and without any loss of generality, we can take, uh, scale it to one. And uh, somebody is, uh, somebody is uh, has a uh, value x naught, which is, which is here. And the, the, the game is to, uh, is to identify x naught. So this is the unknown uh, value. And I'm given uh, n data, xi. And this is a supervised problem. So I'm given also the, the, the labels. The labels are that i if xi is greater than x naught, and it's the label is L low if xi is less than x naught. Okay, so I wanna reach a precision epsilon. So what I want to uh, what I want to achieve is that I would like to say that my my uh, 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 boundary in this case it's very simple it's one point but you you can imagine that in multi dimension this can get complicated it can also be not a line it can be a curved 
uh, function. So this is just a prototypical example, and I'll give you references later for the for the more uh, uh, relevant problems. So precision epsilon, what does it mean? It means that I would like to squeeze my value into an interval, which is, for example, like this. So I would like to get to the point that I know that my uh, value, which separates high and low, is located in an interval which has a size, epsilon. Okay, so how do I do this in a passive uh, in a passive setting? What do I mean by passive setting? Passive setting, I mean that I'm given a bunch of data which are random. Okay, so random and data. Okay, so x i x n. And let's see, uh, let's see how, how well we can do in such a, in such a setting. Now, uh, I have to squeeze my, uh, my points here. Therefore, what I really want to achieve is that I would like to get to the point that I have um, one point here, and I have one point here in the interval. And then I know because this one is gonna be low, this one is gonna be high. And therefore with this kind of situation, I'll be able to get my, to my, get my binder, boundary squeezed between these two values. And therefore I'm localizing my boundary with the precision that I, that I want. So at the end of the day, what I would like to, to reach is having two points apart from factors of order one, the probability that is going to give me how many data points I need in order to reach a certain precision will be given by the probability that I get two points into this interval here. Okay. Then there's a factor, there's a simple factor. So let's calculate the uh, complementary event, and then we'll subtract from one. So the complementary events is that I have zero points zero points in the interval, interval. or one point. Okay. So these are the two events that are complementary to what I get. So I sum the two probabilities and then I subtract one and I will get the probability of reaching my precision. So let's calculate these two probabilities. The probability of zero points in the interval, that's easy because my interval is one. The length of this is epsilon. Therefore, the probability that with n points, I don't get any of them into the interval is one minus epsilon to the n. And then the probability of having a single point into one, into that, is given by one minus epsilon to the n minus one. So n minus one points are outside. And there's a single point which is inside, which the probability is epsilon. And of course, it can be any one of the n points. And therefore, there's a factor n, which counts. Which counts. So now if I sum P0 plus P1, what I get is uh, one minus epsilon to the n minus one, and then it's one plus n minus one epsilon, which is this. So uh, this factor here is roughly the exponential of minus n minus one epsilon, and this is So now, uh, if I want to bring this one here down to delta, so I want this to be less than a factor uh, delta. So I want the probability for this to happen to be below uh, delta because this is a stochastic uh, 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 problem. And uh, if I want to bring that 
this one I can, I'm not sure it's a good idea to erase. Okay, let's move that away, sorry. So if I bring this uh, factor here, exponential to minus n minus one epsilon, one minus plus n minus one epsilon, I want this to be less than uh, delta. And then you just invert this and you immediately get that n is going to scale like one over epsilon log of one over delta. And if you take delta, then n of epsilon so in the random case the number of data points that you're going to need in order to squeeze your uncertainty and reach a precision of order epsilon with a probability of error which is order epsilon is going to scale like one over epsilon with the logarithmic correction okay so that's the passive case that as good as you can get if you just wait for the data and you don't do anything they come randomly and you just process them and with n of them you know from this formula here how good you can uh, on average uh, do typically do okay now what i mean by active what i mean by active in this case is that you interrogate your system Okay, so the system is a supervised problem. So there's an oracle which is telling you how, if I give you an input data, what the label is going to be. And so active in this case is that you interrogate your system. You don't just wait for the system to provide you a, a datum you ask for the label of particular values of uh, 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 of the input and this is a problem which is actually has been considered quite uh, 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 in some detail there are several pa pa several papers that uh, deal with this problem i'll give you the simple uh, answer and then you can look into the original references in particular so this uh, proceeding of fifth workshop uh, computational uh, learning theory. And this is uh, pages 287 to 94. And then there's another one which is Freud. True. Shamir. Tishbi. Tishbi, and it's machine learning 1997. This in particular deal with the problem that I'll mention in a second. So this, these problems are, are, you can look into this, uh, these papers. I'll be doing the very simple thing of telling you what, uh, what you can do uh, actively. So actively, what does it mean? As I said, that you interrogate your system. You ask the label for some particular points. Yes. Sure. No, it's, I'm sure it's not going to be the last. So don't say last because it's not. Uh, just on about the, uh, the passive case. Yes. Um, so presumably, there's an asymmetry uh, in the uh, tightness of these bounds if x0 is not you know, sure. way off to the right. Yes. But those are just the factors of order unity. Is that... Total unity. I'm just giving you the simple thing. You can work out in detail when you get close. You, there's, there's factor of order unity. But I'm just, I just want to get to the scaling and in particular contrast this one over epsilon log epsilon versus the active case. The active case is going to be order log of one over epsilon. That's the point I want to bring home. Okay. So factor of order unity are, are not essential. But yes, there are factors of order unity. 
Okay, so now when you start being active, of course you can make mistakes. In this case, it's quite easy to see that how not to make mistakes. Because for example, imagine for a second that you, you were given a certain bunch of data and you reach the, uh, the situation where there's a boundary to the left. This one was called low. And there's a boundary to the right, which was called high. Okay. So you reach this state where you were, you, the closest point to the right is this BL, and the closest high point to the, is to the left is this one. Okay. So you squeeze your, your boundary within this BL and BR. Now, when I start, when you, you're passive, you just wait and you process your, your datum. And if there's a datum here, which is left, which is low, then you shift your new boundary to here and you keep doing this. Okay, so that's clear what you have to do. Now, in the active case, of course, you can do stupid things. And the stupid thing, for example, you start interrogating your system and you start interrogating your system for data points which are not in the interval, which are outside of the interval. Of course, if I ask the label of a point which is here, which is outside of my interval, that's a totally useless uh, question that I'm asking. I'm wasting my time and I'm wasting data because I already know the answer. The answer is that on this side is going to be low and on this side is going to be high. Unless there are errors and there are things here, I'm saying that the Oracle, the Oracle is faithful. So it's a total waste of time to ask about labels of these points on these two sides. What I want to do is that I want to ask labels of points within the interval. And you also know how you should ask and what point you should be asking within this interval BL and BR. Right? So what I should be asking, imagine I'm given BL, the interval BL and BR. Okay? I reach this point. Where do you, what, what, what label you're going to ask Next. Right, that's right. So what you want to do is that you want to apply a method of bisection. So the label that you want to ask is BL plus BR over two, and you want to ask the label of this point here. That's the bisection method, and that's the way you can, you, you can more effectively squeeze. By the way, this method, if you think in terms of information theory, that's, that's doing exactly what information theory is asking you to do, is telling you that you should be doing, because you're asking the question which is the most uncertain. So with the data that you have available, which is that the interval is here, you expect that the middle point is going to, to be the point of maximum uncertainty because there's half probability that the point is low or it's high. So you're asking the question which is most uncertain, which in the game, in the guessing games of information theory, information theory tells you that you should ask the question with maximum uncertainty. So this one is gonna bring you one bit of information per question asked. It's gonna tell you, and it's gonna move your, it's gonna move your boundary exactly to the middle between these two which is going to be here. Now, you don't know whether this is gonna be low moved here or high moved here, but certainly you're gonna squeeze your interval by half. So if you squeeze your interval by, by half, what is the size of the uh, BR minus BL after N steps? Well, BR minus BL after N steps it's actually going to be two to the minus n. And therefore, if I want to squeeze this below epsilon, the n of epsilon is going to be given by this one, again, apart from factors of order unity. So what you see from this is that by, uh, by interacting with the data and asking questions actively, you can of course make big mistakes and it can take forever. But if you do it smartly, and in this case, being smart is kind of obvious because you already know the bisection method, you can bring the 
a number of data points that you need from one over epsilon to the log of one over epsilon. Okay. So this is to give you a sense of how activity can be uh, useful. And I've given you, because it's a, it's a school and because it's a course, I've given you the one dimensional case, but you can imagine that this problem in multi-dimension, how you're gonna find the separate the, the separation boundary between, for example, two regions that you're interested in. This can get in high dimension quite complicated. So the bisection method, which is obvious in one dimension because it's one dimensional and therefore there's an order which is naturally defined. Already in two dimension, it's not obvious how to do it. And what these uh, authors do in these papers here is that they define a method which is called query by committee. So what they do is that they define a, uh, rather than having a single student which is learning uh, the boundary, they have a committee, they have a bunch of students learning uh, the, the location of the boundary. And then they, uh, they ask the question which splits the, uh, the, the audience of students exactly in half. So they ask a question about the location of the point that you want to know the boundary that you want to know the label in such a way that half of the uh, learning committee would say low and half of the other uh, the committee would say high so they're kind of implementing in an empirical way this idea of information theory that you should be asking the question which the maximum uncertainty and they transfer the uncertainty uh, to the committee to the composition of the committee that will uh, that will ask these questions. And they show that, in fact, this method, in the limit where the committee grows inside, approaches in the one dimensional case the bisection method. And in the multi dimensional case, is quite effective in located, even complicated boundaries. And they do it first in this first paper, they do it empirically. And then in this paper here, there's also some theorems where they prove. Uh, the scaling as a function of the different parameters of the problem. Okay. So, <clears throat> but the important point is that you have this active uh, nature of the querying the, the system for some particular, for some particular values and some particular uh, uh, labels, which is going to bring down the, uh, the expected number of uh, data points that you need. Okay, so that's one example. You have a question? Yes. How do we choose the next point? Like after choosing this um, BR plus BL by two. Yes. Now next point will be this BR and that point, right? Yes. But how do we choose that? Okay. So uh, how do you do this? So let's do it. So let's do the first step. Zero step. Oh, I should write that high. So that's the beginning. I'm taking a flat prior. So zero one. I don't know anything. Okay. If you have a prior, just put it in and but simple one, no prior. Zero one. So in this case, you ask the label for the middle point one half. Okay. Now the middle point one half. The oracle is going to tell you this one at this stage, B left is equal to zero and B right is equal to one. First step, you ask one half. Now, the oracle is going to tell you the label of one half and it could be high or it could be low. Let's take one, one case, which is that the X zero was here, for example, just for the purpose of illustrating this. Then what is going to happen is that this is a this is given low, okay, and then BL will be given by one half, and BR will be given by one. Okay, then from now on, this is one half, this is one. Now you choose the next point, which is going to be in the middle between these two, and you keep going and you bisect the system and you're gonna to get to the precision that I was doing. Okay. Is it clear? 
Wait, just one second, because he was shaking his head. So I, I'm not sure I answered the question. Yeah, yeah. We always choose one high and one low point, like while going, right? Say it again. Like uh, after you get this half point, yes, you are rejecting this low point. Yeah. Because this is the new low point. Okay. So imagine. Let's do the other one. Okay. So let's imagine for a second that x zero was here. Okay. okay. Now, when I ask the next question, and this is going to be a three half, three quarter. Okay. So the next point that I'm going to ask is going to be three quarter. Now, what is going to happen is that BL will stay one half and BR is going to become three quarter. Yeah. And then you keep going. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Got it. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. This is a zero probability. This is a zero probability event. You can define, you can define things. For example, the Oracle could tell you that if you locate it exactly, but these are details of zero probability that happen. It's never gonna happen that you get exactly the, the, the exact value. Anyway, you, you can define this kind of things. Uh, you know, you can say that the Oracle is gonna tell you low in this case or high, depending on that, you, you scale differently. But anyway, it's a zero probability event. So in this reasoning that I'm doing, it's, 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 totally, it's totally irrelevant. Any other question? Yes. Yeah. So if, if there's some stochasticity in what the Oracle is saying, like as it approaches the X naught, if there is some stochasticity in saying whether it's left or right. At this level, there's, you know, the only stochasticity is what uh, your colleague was mentioning. If you go straight on top of the, uh, so if I get exactly the value, then you could introduce some stochasticity and say, for example, that it's going to tell you low or a light, right, um, low or high uh, at, at, at random. Otherwise, this is a deterministic. As I formulated, it's deterministic. Now, you can introduce errors by the oracle, which means that the oracle, for example, could give you the answer, but with a mistake, and then the system becomes stochastic. And you can read about all this in the in the papers, which, which are there. I, the point I'm trying to make here is just that by interrogating the system and being active, so taking the pain of asking questions and not just waiting for the data to come, you can achieve a reduction from one over epsilon to log of one over epsilon. That's the point I'm trying to make, which relates to this active versus passive learning. On this problem, then you can work and you can do many variants uh, uh, that, that are related to, to what you do. Okay, I have uh, a set of uniform uh, points. Yes. Okay? And if I construct an histogram, uh, and I mm -hmm. want that uh, this one point is uh, in the range of zero plus or minus x, I want to change. I get immediately that I, I need a number of pins in my histograms mm -hmm. that must be of the order of one over x. Mm -hmm. So uh, without doing any more complex uh, in uh, what your uh, way of reasoning uh, is uh, improving with respect to what I'm saying. So this is the passive case that you're, that you're taking. Yeah. So you, you can do a histogram or you can just count. In fact, you don't even need the histogram. You can just need to, to take, you have high and low. Yeah. So you just take the highest low point, the lowest high point, and you squeeze your, uh, your, uh, your boundary within the two. So that's, I guess, what, you, what, what you're saying. Yeah. So this is the passive case and you get one over epsilon. That's all. Now, what I'm saying is that uh, 
if you don't just wait for the points to come randomly, but you actively interrogate your system, you can bring it to log. But what you're saying is absolutely, it's, the, it's what is being, it's being done here. I mean, this one was just done uh, yeah, because, yeah. Be what, yeah, because you want to calculate a few things and uh, the probability, this gives you the probability for this to, for this to happen. So that's why I was doing it this way. But the scaling one over epsilon is kind of very intuitive and one way is. Which one is called in the Yes. Right. Sure. That's right. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> that's the that's the point. Once you get out of the passive case, then you you have to to try and be be smart. In this particular example here. Uh, these people devise the method, which is the query by committee, which is what I was mentioning, which was I was mentioning, meaning that each one of them, each student is constructing its own, uh, uh, its own uh, interval. You're going to have your own one. I'm going to have mine. He's going to have his. And you take a bunch of them. And the idea is to use the idea of information theory that the question that should be asked is the most informative one. And the most informative one is the maximal disagreement. So it's not easy for the piece of the audience, but the idea of this method squared by committee is that you should ask the question that splits the audience in half and half. In this particular yes. case, because of zero and one, the Shannon entropy is going sure. to peak at the half. Yeah. Well, in, in general, if you take a multidimensional case, nobody's going to give you exactly the contour. Nobody's going to give you this bisection, which is in the middle. That's why they create this committee. And so they define the entropy that you cannot calculate easily because the geometry is too complicated. You sample this entropy by creating this committee. And then you, you use the Shannon entropy within the committee and half and half. That's the idea. You cannot calculate this. Uh, you cannot calculate this. This simply this this uh, this uh, this, bo this boundary and this Shannon entropy. So you replace this by the committee, and then you ask the question, which is the most informative one within the committee, which is a principle of maximum disagreement. That's the idea of this method. But there's more. There's more. In general, there's a, there's a, there's. A, I mean, it's the whole problem of our being active it's uh, it's a complicated i'll give you some some ideas but it's an open problem in general yes 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 but if you're in two dimension you see the problem the problem is that So this is the two-dimensional space. The boundary could be the boundary could be something like this. Okay. So if I have a point which is on this side and the point on this side. So now and a bunch of points on this other side. So this is high, low, and so on. So how do you go now and and ask the next question? In one D, it's obvious. I take this. It's going to be this. I take the. But in multi-dimension, how do you go? It's not, it's not obvious. That's the difficulty. And in multi-dimension, just, just this problem gets more and more amplified. That's why you need to do things different. And that's why the problem is complicated. By the way, def defining a, a, a separation like this, it's exactly a classification problem like the one that we were discussing before. It's a support vector machine. In that case, it's a plane. Or in general, it's a classification. So this is this is an example of a supervised problem that you can approach passively by taking the batch of data and doing something, or actively by interrogating your system. Any other question? Okay. So 
20 minutes, 21 minutes. It's a good time to introduce the uh, multi arm bandits. If there's no question, no other question on this. Okay. We're good. Okay. Okay, so now we move to another problem, which is a classical problem in decision making. So called multi arm bandits. What's a multi arm bandits? Uh, okay, so arm, arm is a slot machine. Okay, you have a bunch of slot machines. An arm is what you pull of the slot machine. And multi-arm just means that there's, there's several of them. There are variants of this problem where you have a single one, then it becomes a stopping problem, whether you should keep playing or not playing, I'll mention in a second. But let's, let's say you have uh, multiple uh, slot machines. Yes. Oh, good. It's good for you because the next definition is why they're called bandits. And bandits is called because typically the slot machines is something that you play and you can win or you lose with the probability mu. Okay, with probability mu, you win one dollar, let's say. And with probability one minus mu, you lose. Okay, so just imagine you. Let's forget the, the slot machine. Let's say you toss a coin, okay? So this way, toss a coin. And if it's head, you win uh, uh, one. Uh, the, the coin, of course, is biased because otherwise you know exactly that it's one half and there's nothing to, to learn. There's a prob the coin, the coin is, is, is biased. So with probability mu, you're gonna, you're gonna win. And with probability one minus mu, you're gonna, you're gonna lose. Um, is that clear? Okay. So the, the probability of winning is, is mu, and there's a probability mu A, there's a probability mu B, and there's a probability mu C. The reason it was called bandits, as I said, is that typically in the casinos, the slot machines are biased in such a way that you statistically you always lose, and therefore they, they were called uh, bandits. Okay. Um, so now what's the uh, objective? Let's suppose that, take the simple case, and let's suppose that you have two of them. Okay? So two armed uh, 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 bandits, which means that you have mu A and mu B. And what's the objective? The objective is to maximize cumulative reward. which means that, uh, um, let's take the discounted case, uh, lambda of t, where zero, as I was saying before, and the expected value bar of t is going to be mu. So, um, the expected uh, maximized cumulative expected value. Typically, you care about the expected value. So what I mean by this, I'm going to get the reward 0, 1 at time t, uh, depending on the action that I take. In this case, the action is which uh, slot machine I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play, whether it's number one or number two. I'm going to get an expected reward, which is the probability of winning mu of A or B, depending on the action that I took. And this is the expected reward that I will uh, have. Okay. So what is happening? Uh, let's say 
let's take a simple strategy which is passively explore and then commit. So that's a very simple, that's a very simple strategy. And I'll try and show you why this one is not quite optimal. It can be okay, but it's not gonna be optimal. So what does it mean? It means the closest to being passive is that I make N rounds of exploration. Passive. For example, I just do A, B, A, B, A, B. Or you can mix them. So you play, since you don't know anything, you just play half and half or just alternate, you, you play half times A, half time B. But, but this end data points, you just don't ask questions. You just play blindly half and half because you have no prior information. If you have some prior information, you, of course you put it here. You're gonna play more the one that there's a prior which is positive. But in general with a flat prior, you play N, N half of them and N half of the other one. Uh, so if I'm playing, let's say for, uh, uh, this is the discounted reward. There's another problem, which is the so-called problem of finite horizon. Finite horizon, you, you just play for a fixed number, capital T, and you want to maximize the reward, the total reward that you got out of that. Okay? So th this is the discounted case. And this is the uh, finite horizon case that I will be discussing here because it's slightly easier in this formulation. Okay, so uh, N rounds, N of course is gonna be smaller than capital T. What do I get after this N rounds of gain? Well, I'm gonna get an empirical value of uh, the probability of winning. I'll get two empirical probabilities. And um, the way they're gonna look like, there's going to be a probability like this, a PDF like this, which is, let's say here, it's mu of D. And there's going to be another probability distribution here. which is centered at mu a. Okay. So these are the posteriors. Based on, the, uh, based on what I've seen, we can write the formulas, but you, you all know the central limit theorem. So you know that close to the center, these two probability distributions will be Gaussian and will be centered around this value here. And the standard deviation is going to be mu this one times one minus a divided by the square root of n. So you know all this stuff. We'll be doing large deviations momentarily, but this is the image that you have. So where's the difficulty of the problem? The difficulty of the problem is that there's an uncertainty region, which is around here. So there's a chance that this one here is in fact a mistake. So the fact that mu b empirical is less than mu a could be due to uh, statistical fluctuations. And in fact, the real value of mu b could be to the right of mu a. There's a probability for this to happen. And so this overlap region in the middle here is the dangerous part. And this tail on this side here is the dangerous part that could lead to a, to, to a mistake. So uh, on the other hand, these values mu a and mu b, they will tend, if you look at them as a function of time, if the real value is here, then it starts somewhere here, and then it goes like this. And then the fluctuations around here are of the order of one over square root. So that's simple things. 
uh, now, um, how do I play then? Well, after this N rounds of exploration, then I commit. Committing means that I choose the one which is higher. So you pick the arm with highest mu. Okay. So you have these two empirical values of the probability of reward, and you commit to the one that based on your uh, current knowledge has the highest probability of reward. That as simple as uh, as simple as this. Now, I forgot to mention uh, that the applications of this problem, this problem, which seems like a uh, very, and it is an elementary one, in fact, has a number of applications, number of applications which. Uh, So maybe I'll, I'll mention the application nine minutes. I'll mention the application at the beginning next time, and I'll do the analysis of the scaling of the of the error, and I will mention the application next time. Okay, but just beware: there's many applications, like in animal behavior, in resource allocation, in uh, clinical trials, in uh, 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 experiment design. I'll mention this in detail next next time. So let's analyze uh, uh, the uh, the error that we are going to make on this. Okay. So after n trials, what is the situation, and what is the expected value of the regret? So what is the regret? Now there was a question before. Uh, whether you can include the cost rather than the regret. Now we're going to switch to the regret. The regret is the complementary of the, of the reward. So you ask uh, how much I could have gained, and you take the difference between how much you could have gained if you knew exactly what was the right arm minus what you, you play without this, uh, this knowledge. So how much is the expected regret? The expected regret is going to be uh, so. Let's say that mu a is larger than mu b, just to for the purpose of the argument. So, how much regret I'm going to get in the in the trial uh, phase? Regret is this, and it's easy to understand because I played. If I knew which one which arm was the best, which in this case is A, I would have played A all the time. Now I played B n half of the time. Therefore, the expected value of the regret is what I would have got minus what I got, I, I re actually received on average. Okay? And this difference is giving you the regret. Now, this is the exploratory phase. Now let's go into the commit. Well, the commit I keep playing until capital T on one arm. If the arm is right, then I have no regret because I've identified the right arm. But if I misidentify the arm, then I'm gonna be playing T minus N times the wrong arm. And this is going to lead to a mistake, to a regret, which is this. And the probability that this is going to happen is the probability that the empirical value B is larger than the empirical value A. Right? Is that clear? Okay. So what's this probability? What is what? T is the total number, is the total duration of the game, is the finite horizon. So how many times I'm gonna play total? And N is the commitment phase. So I'm breaking my, 
zero t into a, a phase of exploration and then a phase of commitment. Any other question? Guarantee? No, 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 no. Both of them, both of them, they have a certain probability mu of giving a reward. So this one has a probability mu A, and this one has a probability mu B. Both of them are between zero and one, and you don't know them. And you start with a prior that you don't know anything about them. To play at each step, right? No, no, it's not that you have to play. You can do whatever you want. You can even play a single one. But you realize that playing a single one is going to lead you to a disaster. Because if you play a single one, let, let's suppose, let's play in a, in, a, in a certain way, okay? So let's suppose that you play one. At the beginning, you don't know anything, so you pick one or two. Okay? And imagine that you're lucky and you win. So you're going to say, okay, I won. Therefore, I keep playing on that one. But this could be just by chance, and the other one could have a much higher probability. Therefore, in all these problems, because the environment is not, is not given and you don't have much information, it's a, it's a general prescription that you should be balancing. This is called the exploration versus exploitation trade-offs. There's no versus, in fact. It's the exploitation-exploration trade-off. So in all these problems, you cannot just go greedily and exploit what you, what you got before, because if you don't explore your environment, chances are you're going to miss opportunities. So in general, it's not a good idea to go just very greedily. Of course, if you have the horizon of one step, so imagine for a second to get back to the question of the lambda, how do you pick the lambda? Okay? Imagine that you're playing horizon two, t equal two. Okay? It's not a very realistic case, but imagine you play two. Okay? So how do you play with two? It's very simple. You play the first one blindly, and then if you win, you're going to play again the same. Or if you lost, then you're going to play the other one. Okay? But this is t equal 2. So this is a very short horizon. If you start playing as, as the horizon gets longer and longer, you have to explore because otherwise you're going to miss chances of identifying the right arm. And in the limit where t is going to infinity, you have to explore more and more. And actually, we're going to show how much you have to explore and how much you have to play even on the apparently bad one in order not to miss opportunities. Uh, this is Ben. Yeah. Uh, is there any optimum t percent of HPG? That's what I'll be doing. Uh, and I think I'll be doing it next time. Uh, but yes, there's an optimal one. But the point I'm trying to make is that uh, this one will not be optimal, okay? So just to, to, uh, to, to, to get to the point that I want to, to make, this strategy here, it's a decent one. If you make things reasonably well, you can do things which are not too bad, but it's not the right way of doing things. The right way of doing things is not to wait n rounds without doing anything but it's to actively interact continuously at each time step to choose your arm in a certain way. And I'll show you how to do it in a certain way. But you have to interact continuously with the stream of data with the environment. You cannot just passively wait for n rounds like this. You have to be active. And of course, in being active, you can make mistakes, but you can also do much better. And I wanna show you that this strategy here can lead to big mistakes, uh, can do reasonable things. But if you really want to approach the optimality, then you should do things actively and 
at each time step choose the bandit, the arm in a, in a certain way. Any other question? Good. Go Perfect. process. Yeah, so. because there's 45 seconds. Left. So <laughs> if it were right. a Marco process, we usually filter the space and uh, take the events which are available uh, in our decision making, right? Correct. So, so, yeah, so maybe in this 45 seconds, let me write for you the posterior probability distribution. I, I guess that's the question you're, you're, you're asking. So the posterior probability distribution, imagine you're, you, you played arm A uh, a certain number of times, N A, and you won W A times, then what's the probability, the posterior probability of the, of the reward? Then this will be given by uh, uh, mu A, or call it and then there's a, a, a normalization factor which is the uh, beta Euler function so these factorials which will be given by this and the probability of the two well, I'm using PA or mu A. This will be given by this times this. So the the Markovianities in this, I don't need to remember all the numbers that I played. I just need to remember these two numbers here, and they will tell me everything. Maybe I didn't answer your question. You want to ask something uh, else? The second part was that uh, here we are considering a reward also, right? The total reward, uh, which includes the discounted factor times. Well, no, yeah. that, right now I'm not doing, uh, at the beginning I was saying uh, oh, okay. this, okay. but in this particular analysis that I'm doing, I'm looking at the finite horizon case. Then I'll mention the discounted case later, but I'm doing this one here without discount. It's a finite horizon problem. Okay, I'm done with time. Uh, so any, any more questions? Okay, so if no, then we will thank the speaker for such a wonderful talk. And then we have a coffee break. So we will assemble back by 11.